Hey everybody, it's Busk with Battles with Bus number 378, and today we're going to be doing battle with Fiora Pantheon. And so the, the Fiora should indicate this is the eternal season, the variety patches here. Uh, we're getting in our first set of battles within this month of uh, the eternal format. We're looking to see how this goes. We also have some interesting impact stuff with the new cards coming out of the variety patch, along with the uh, the buffs and nerfs coming out of the 4-5 patch, all of which uh, affect this deck. And so to get you familiar with the new cards, if you haven't seen it, there's Sacrificial Scholar. That's this two-cost faded unit with the last breath. We get to create in hand copies of the first three spells that targeted this thing. And so I think it's uh, very easy to kind of make the comparison to this to say something like Saga Seeker, the one mana 1-1 one, one faded unit that you just play in the early game and just start tagging with a bunch of spells. But uh, the thing that I think that we've really kind of looked over uh, in terms of the Sacrificial Scholar are the powerful things that we can do with, say, strikes and rallies. And so we are kind of okay if we just play this early game to where we play uh, the, the Scholar on turn three and put a gem on it. In turn four, we put a gem on it. Turn five, maybe we play a Pale Cascade. Uh, gets a good trade and all those cards come back to hand. That's a good amount of value off of a Faded Unit. But we also have these just big options in Demacia by playing things like Single Combat, Concerted Strike, and Golden Aegis. And so this is hopefully going to set us up for some situations to where uh, maybe we make a really big Scholar. It gets into a combat to where it's going to die. It Single Combat's off to a smaller unit then it trades up with a bigger one when it dies we get like two gems and a single combat back in hand that's a very good and strong value the the next thing that kind of ties in with that uh, is we like all of our cards to be both good early and good late and the sacrificial scholar can do that as well the thing i kind of imagine with this is say it's like turn eight we want to play a golden aegis there's no uh, real unit on board that's needing it. Uh, you know, we aren't really looking to buff a Pantheon or buff a Fiora or something. Uh, the Sacrificial Scholar is still a very reasonable target. If we late game target the Scholar with the Golden Aegis, that's going to be a spell attached to it. We get into combat. It's probably not going to die because it has barrier, but over the course of the next turn and throughout the rest of the game, the opponent does have to worry about this random Scholar that's on board because as soon as it dies, it's just going to turn into another Golden Aegis. And that also kind of continues to combo off with the single combats to where if we play the golden Aegis, get the rally, now we can kind of just kill off our own unit at will. And so uh, I'm kind of interested to see how these combos go with the Sacrificial Scholar. Otherwise, this is a, a very similar to a Fiora Pantheon decks of old. This deck was very strong for maybe one and a half seasons before everything in it got nerfed. It's a very strong uh, board control deck. It works fantastically uh, in a format full of a bunch of small units, whether or not that's something from like Scouts or something from Nora. Uh, having these units that you can come in and threaten lethals against with Fiora while you're also developing the this big brawler strategy to where uh, if your opponent is going to have 20 stats on board, if they have one 20, 20, that's very challenging for us to overwhelm through. But if the those 20 stats are spread out across six units because they have a bunch of two twos and three twos, our big overwhelms that come out of units like Pantheon and Camp 4 are much more powerful. And so uh, as this format starts to develop, I assume that uh, at the very beginning stages, there's going to be a lot of unit-based decks running around. And so that should hopefully give Fiora Pantheon a good chance to shine. Uh, the last card I want to make note of before we really dive in is going to be the Targonian Telstones. Now, this is a card I'm not certain if we really want to be running around with this in uh, Eternal. Having access to Hush is a very powerful ability in Eternal, uh, so it may have its place. But uh, the thing to notice with the Targonian Telstones is this got double buffed as a result of the 4-5 patch. The uh, big time invokes that come out of Behold the Infinite, the uh, Supernovas, the AoE Obliterate, and the plus two, plus two to your whole team uh, no longer have to behold a Celestial. And so those are upgraded. You can even look at things like uh, the, the Serpent, the one cost, uh, or it's a zero cost, Two one whatever it is the, the 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 small invoke challenger thing is buffed as well and so a lot of cards out of the invoke package now better uh, and this can be generated with behold the infinite off the targonian telstones and the blessing of targon now costs four mana instead of three and so it's a a, a very powerful card in the sense that uh, a, a lot of the utility that this brings just got buffed here in the recent patch and so, good stuff. Sacrificial Scholar, Fiora, Pantheon, OTKs, uh, big attacks with Camphor and Pantheon. Excited to see all of this. 
let's go ahead and jump on into battle. And so we're having to play in the casual queues. The ranked queues aren't up yet. They won't be up until uh, today as this video is released tomorrow for me. And so as soon as those queues come up, we're ready to start the grind from Wood 4 <laughs> or whatever, whatever it makes you do. The, the word on the street is your standard rank doesn't matter. And so you have to be starting uh, back in the space of bronze. And so <laughs> we'll have to see how the climb goes. But reasonable start. We got our Scholar. We got our Cultist. We mulliganed into an equipment in the Darkened Lodestone. Lots of very powerful things we can do here on these opening turns. Things like the Darkened Lodestone are uh, a little bit more important as we use the, the Sacrificial Scholar if we're wanting to get these targets earlier. We aren't really uh, guaranteed to have the gems as early as we would like, and so... Uh, Having just this direct target we could put on the Scholar starting on turn three uh, helps to make up for it a little bit if the uh, if the cultist didn't show up. You do also get access to Mountain Goat now that we are in uh, the Lands of Eternal. I'm uh, at, at the get-go, at the start, I think Lunari Cultist is probably just better. Uh, I like the opportunity for this to generate more targets than we would get out of a... Uh, out of a singular uh, thing that we would get from Mountain Goat, but time will tell. We'll have to wait and see uh, which of these we uh, appreciate a little bit more. All right, we're going to get nugged in this combat. Not a big deal. Uh, we're still just in this whole building up phase of the game, and so not too upset with our opponent's board getting to be a little bit better than ours. All right, the second Scholar comes in. Kind of interesting. The opponent shouldn't have too much interactivity playing uh, playing Aatrox Orn. Like, he's not going to have any strikes or anything, so I think we're pretty safe to just slam down this Fiora, uh, and we can look to use the, the, the Scholar onto Fiora to help her grow. We have the Guiding Touch in hand to uh, help keep boosting her up, and it feels like a pretty safe spot for her to be coming in. There shouldn't be any combat tricks capable of getting a kill on her and so we can really just focus on the uh the fiora otk aspect of this game work. all right strike number one. Ooh, you gotta love that you gotta like seeing these seeing these one one comes on the board uh, as you already have your fiora down no complaints here no complaints Hearthguard comes in. He's a big old boy, but not too worried about it. I'm going to drop this spell shield on Fiora while the coast is clear. We can just throw the 1-3 up in front of the Hearthguard and not worry too much about it. We realistically don't even have to worry about any of this deck's damage. Like He's not going to be hitting us with Overwhelms until this Orn comes down. But I don't want to fall super low just in the event. Like when we played Orn, we would play the Wildclaw Ferocity just because it was so powerful if we, say, have a... Uh, if we have like a an omen hawk on board that we've loaded up with an equipment and then you get to ferocity it a little bit later uh, i don't think that's really kind of picked up but uh that was uh that was one of the things that we used to do all right well i'm gonna go ahead and play a gem on fiora to to make sure that we get our target and then we're gonna gonna press forward here now again we made note of this play a little bit earlier as to where we haven't targeted the Sacrificial Scholar with any spells, but we can use things like Concerted Strikes to get targets on him. And so I'm looking at this point to just Concerted Strike into the Averosian Hearthguard. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. The opponent does get the opportunity to maybe Harsh Winds onto the Scholar. Uh, so this isn't going to be a guaranteed kill here. But if he ends up spending a ton of mana this turn just to pre prevent his Hearthguard from dying, then great. And if all of this works, then, you know, double great. We have a fantastic attack here. If he wants to come in and try and trade with our Scholar, we're just going to get Concerted Strikes back into our hand. Very beautiful stuff going on there. All right, GG. Well played. On to the next battle. It's always nice when those cool combos come together in the in the first game. Just returning returning the Concerted Strike back to hand feels, feels pretty good. It's pretty good. All right, on to the next Eternal battle. We're currently undefeated in Eternal. Go us. 
Mark it, mark it on the stat sheet. Undefeated, 100% win rate. Got it. Not only the best in the world according to ftpbus.com, but probably the best in the world according to the stats right now. <laughs> All right, on to the next one. Uh, we're up against Trendemir Yumi. The cat's coming at us. Uh, I, this is a very similar start to the last game to where we'll hold on to the cultist, we'll hold on to the scholar, uh, and then we'll mulligan to look for an equipment or something else to do here in the early game. All right, Pouty Poro coming in. Not a cat. And Fiora turns up. Everything, everything is just seems so familiar. Power both day and night. All right, but good stuff. We'll, we'll continue on with the same game plan from before. We'll have the, the cultist on board. We'll add the scholar next turn. We'll put the darkened lodestone onto the scholar, and then we should get a good attack into... Uh, into opponent here. And then I would assume that we'll just immediately switch over to the Fiora plan. Okay. So there's a nice 3-4 Scholar. Bigger than all of the Poros. Good job, my friend. Then let's get these attacks in. Seems good. Seems good. I don't... I, I don't think we want to play Fiora next turn. We may, just to go ahead and get her on board, but I, I kind of like just taking a gem and getting the Faded onto the Scholar, uh, banking up the three mana, and then going into turn five with uh, uh, with, with a bunch of mana banked up when we actually play the Fiora. As we draw the, ne the next one, and gives us access to Repost and such. Very nice, as opposed to just having her on board with one mana. We still feel the same way? I think so. I'm just going to go ahead and gem. Uh, opponent doesn't have a ton of incentive to attack into our 5-5, so I don't think we're going to get anything special out of dropping a chain vest. You always got that 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 kind of value plan uh, generated up in your head, you know. <laughs> you say, I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to, to get the, the return value on the chain vest if our unit dies, but it's not necessary, I don't think. And then there, I just traded away our unit. I, uh, I'm i not worried about our health total, and I don't want our Sacrificial Scholar getting small when he doesn't need to. And so that was a reasonable trade while the opponent doesn't have any mana. Now we should be able to uh, have this really strong two-pronged attack here to where opponent has to give a ton of respect to Fiora or they'll get OTK'd. And then if they're focusing too hard onto Fiora, the, the Scholar is just going to get, uh, get, get his rampant boosting going on out here. So I think this is good. We should be able to safely go after the Pouty Poro. If he has a Frostbite, then it's not enough to kill Fiora. And then if he starts to play cards like Troll Chant, uh, then we might be able to take down the Poro with Repost. So he's a 5-5 five five now. Do we, the, do we want to play the Repost? I'm... I'm leaning towards the Pale Cascade. It just sucks so much against this particular unit if uh, if this fails. So I'm going to just go with the Repost to ensure that we get the kill. Like if we invest the Pale Cascade and then a opponent has a Troll Chant or an Elixir of Iron or a Pale Cascade of their own and gets out of the combat, then we're going to feel really far behind, especially since that unit's going to come in and just heal itself. So not bad, not bad. Now we're getting to the point to where uh, Pantheon and uh, Camp 4 are going to turn into real threats. Feels like we're just super far ahead at this point. So we barely have the mana to do a lot of this stuff. We don't really need to go for Camp 4. But I'm not opposed to it. You know, getting, that, getting that big unit on board is not a terrible thing. But I, I'm leaning more towards just kind of opening next turn with Chain Vest onto Fiora. That's going to get the flip onto Pantheon. And then we can look towards Camp 4 later. Now that we pick up the Shield Vault, does that make anything different? 
if we get to say shield vault revna and then hook another unit with fiora and then having these two big overwhelms on board i think that's probably going to be enough let's see if we can't just finish this turn especially like i know we can't play trendamir this turn but if he wants to just play some giant unit this is going to work and he's doing a bit of a go tall strategy with his yumi in here so if he wants to replay yumi or, or something to just enhance the stats on board the the singular unit's not going to feel very good here Pouty Poro was, was pretty menacing. That was a, a pretty top-notch draw hitting a 6-6 six, six tough for one mana. But I, I think we're still in pretty good shape here. I don't think that was enough to, to really worry me. And our Pantheon hits Elusive, Fearsome, Spell Shield, Fury, Brash. So we have the the, the big uh, overwhelmed Spell Shieldy bros out here ready to, to soak up those... Uh, soak up those... Uh, whatchamacallit's... Can't die or take damage. I don't think that does what you want. Uh, they're, they're ready to soak up the frostbites. You can still get targeted, though, my friend. Let's drop a little, drop a little rainbow flush on them, you know? I hear that's the key to victory. You just gotta, <laughs> you just gotta hit them with the right emote. So this should be pretty straightforward. We're going to hook the 4-4 with Fiora. Uh, this is the highest health unit he has at the moment. If he's blocking stuff with Revna, uh, we want to just get maximum uh, overwhelm damage in this turn if we can. So We get an attack like this. Looks like we're coming in for 17. Hopefully it's enough. If he minus fives onto the uh, onto the scholar then we still have the lethal here math that one out real good gg we will shake the heavens with our victory all right good stuff and so yeah th this is a, a bit of a bummer with the variety patch i was i was looking at it and i was trying to Think of ways to kind of incorporate a lot of the cards into the, uh, into into the the, excuse me, the eternal format. And it is just like such a tough space to, uh, to to fit these things in. It's like a lot of the cards feel like they're really tuned for standard, and so they're not gonna be they're not gonna be ready for like another month until the next standard format comes in, and then they're just gonna get overshadowed by the release of the new set. And so it's it's a bit of a bummer. Like you look at the the Sharima cat card. There, I look. There's not really enough cats. I'm kind of interested in, in like Alpha Wild Claw plus Wild Claw's Porosity plus the uh, the the Sharima cat card. But I, I don't feel like that's actually a real deck. And it, it's just things like that across the board like are you really able to play a uh, a, a sixth cost improvised unit in uh, in eternal i mean probably not it would certainly be good in standard but in eternal it's a much faster and a much dicier format to where those five cost cards have to really matter and i feel like my my stance was that riot just did things out of order uh, i felt like now that we're like here and i've thought about it i, I felt like eternal should show up during the balance patch and so the new set would come out you play standard the balance patch comes out uh, that kind of edits the new cards that have been released and that's when you play eternal and then the next month the variety set comes out while you're in standard there's the smaller card pool out there giving those cards much more opportunity to be relevant and i, I just felt like uh, having eternal out here with uh, with the variety patch just kind of diminishes its uh its importance all right we're up here against jen is gay it's very very appropriate name as the as the pride month stuff is released we got our rainbow flush uh, twisted fade out here ready to celebrate i hope the opponent's getting getting good usage out of those free emotes and free icons tom is here you can drop a little rainbow flush on him you know get that on the board Get a little Steve action out here. Okay, got it. I think maybe. All right. So a much more uh, painful start here without the equipment. Opponents out here dropping big units on us and stuff. We're going to have to take this game just a little bit slower. Uh, since we don't really want to get into combats with the 4-2s. But this is that kind of interesting space I was talking about as to where 
Are we interested in, say, playing single combat onto the Scholar to take down the Perfectionist? It's not big enough at this point to survive, but we would get the gem back, the single combat back, and then get the kill onto the Perfectionist. And so you know, that's, a, that's a, a pretty decent value all tied up into a single card. But I, I think we're good to just uh, keep on this faded path for a little bit. So many single combats. Guiding Touch in Camp 4. Okay. No moon, no Let's just send everybody. Like, if he has a card, like if he has a, a Make It Rain or a Pale Cascade or something, or a, a Make It Rain or a, a Mystic Shot, whatever, he's just going to block our big unit. But if he doesn't have it, I think I'm pretty okay with trading off one of these Lunari Cultists just to get this giant chunk of damage in, especially as we're in this space now. Uh, to where we have the two copies of Camp 4 in hand. And we should just be in a spot to where uh, we're just going to punch in Overwhelms. And so uh, we'll drop a Camp 4 next turn. We'll drop a Camp 4 two turns from now. And then we're uh, pretty close to just getting lethal off of it. I mean, we might even be in the spot to where on our next turn we we have Camp 4, but then we just uh, uh, play Golden Aegis and try and get a Rally kill. All right, I see what opponent's up to. You're you're making counterfeit copies of all the treasure cards. Very, very clever. Very clever. But I I think we're gonna get to boom them before uh, before the big combos come online. Do we want a single combat before we roll into next turn? The the idea with that being. Maybe we should have just single combated instead of gemmed. Oh, is he just giving it to us for free? Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say, do we want to uh, kill off that big unit so that we can hook the fallen feline uh, with the camp four before combat starts? Just get this big mass of damage on board. Uh, but he made that attack for us anyways. We didn't need to, didn't need to do it. All right, GG, well played. Victory for Pantheon. Victory for Cam4 and the Scholar. That's who really, really drove that one home today. GG. All right, what have we got here? A little bit of a, a little bit of Gangplank Swain. Sure thing. This is gonna be our first game without the uh, the Gift Giver and the Scholar. Feels different. Feels weird. Still a pretty good start, though. The the Scholar turned up. We have a lot of targets for him in the early game. Uh, the the Broadwing is, is strong as well. I'm on board. I, I've just been pretty happy with this curve of Scholar, 2-drop, Dark, and Lodestone. That's been pretty good all on its own. So I'm thinking that's the way that we want to start. We did just pick up Fiora, so we have some options in terms of uh, pivoting off of this the Sacrificial Scholar plan. But I, I think I like this. We can even look to just play a Pale Cascade this turn if we really wanted to. I'm not particularly excited about just dropping Pale Cascade onto the Scholar, but options are there. If he plays a... Uh, I don't know what cost, what cost six mana at this point. If he plays a double up onto the Scholar, we can drop the Pale Cascade in. And a Deckhand. A little scary. I'll give it that. At least all of our units are outside of Make It Rain range right now. So we may end up like losing our bird in this combat, but it's not too bad. I guess it's not a bird. We gotta... <laughs> we can't... We we can't call this thing a bird anymore since it didn't uh, it didn't pick up the subtype in the new set. But reasonable nonetheless, and then I'm happy with this hook of the scholar onto the powder keg. I assume he's probably gonna play a card here. You usually don't just run your powder kegs out here and have them uh, get blown up for no reason. But uh, we'll see. Oh boy, he's going for the the combat keg. I don't think that works how you wanted it to. But. We'll take it. Alright. 
Looking good. Yordle Grifter coming in. Nailing that nab. Hitting that allegiance. I wonder I wonder how much of a coin flip that one was. <laughs> but all in all, those looks pretty reasonable. I, I don't think we have to go super heavy on the faded stuff here. How do we feel about just putting the the Wandering Shepherd onto the Broadwing and trying to pick up a point of toughness or a point of health, whatever we call it in this game. Uh, I think that's okay. We missed across the board. That's unfortunate, but not the end of the world. We'll just take the fix of 5,000. That's the, the better equipment of the bunch. So don't make this mistake here. I've done this literally dozens of times to where... <laughs> You attack with the broad wing, you see the three attack on it, and don't realize that you're only going to deal two damage. You're only dealing two damage with this broad wing right now, so we got to watch out for that. But I'm good to just continue to build up board. We can boost the broad wing with the, uh, with the Scholar if we need to. I'm looking to just go ahead and drop a Pale Cascade onto the Scholar for the turn. Let's see, let's see what happens. I'll, I'll bring in the, the hook onto the Broadwing just to keep it from challenging down our units. Maybe he'll put his 3-3 three, three in front of our Scholar and then we get the good Pale Cascade. If he puts the, the Grifter in front of the Mountain Goat, I think we just want a Pale Cascade anyways. Uh, not, onto the, not onto the Goat, but onto the, onto the Scholar. Well, he's going he's gonna to give us the good combat. get the scholar loaded up a little bit uh, it feels like he's getting he, he's getting kind of close to death you know <laughs> there's a a lot of options coming out of a gangplank swain style deck to where you can just kill a damaged unit or something and so if we get a little bit of return value out of the uh out of the dead scholar that wouldn't be so bad So he's only got two mana at this point. We do have to worry uh, about a potential Ravenous Flock. That's the one that's a little bit scary now. I'm looking to to Concerted Strike down the Swain. Um, but things can fail a little bit here. Hmm. If he just blows up our board, how bad is it? It's not horrible. We can kind of clean up with Fiora next turn. We have the the, the Fixum 5000. As long as we just get a little bit of damage onto Swain, I think it's okay. So let's just go ahead and go for it now. So we're going to strike Swain. Strike with our dude. It does tick him up to two, right? So he gets the Faded, and now the Sacrificial Scholar is the proud owner of a Concerted Strike. And so then with the Concerted Strike, uh, if Swain comes in and gets some kind of kill on the turn, then we're still pretty well set with our uh, with our hand here, with those spells coming back. Alright, opponent says bust, that's too much. Is Dim Scholars doing too much work? On to the next one. I was thinking in, in, with this scholar in terms of Poppy Tarek as well. Like, what a wild world this would be if you could play uh, Poppy Tarek with the targetable Relentless Pursuit. Uh, and I, I, I didn't go for it. It feels like Poppy Tarek took too much of a hit not having the, the two targetable rallies. Uh, but uh, that was one of the things. It's like, wow, that would be so many, uh, so many big hits if you could, uh, if you could put both. Tarek and the Scholar into your deck and have all those really high-powered targetable things. Alright, Timo, Caitlyn, Nora. Opponent leading off with the Yotterpus. We'll have to see if we're up against our friend uh, Curious Shellfolk. Hate that card so much. <laughs> Let's see if we, if we can't start the complaining right now. But I think this is an okay space for our bird. If he's got a mystic shot or something here to kill the bird, it's not that big of a deal. And then if we get to roll into these future turns and uh, have the damaged bird on board with the opportunity for some heal, that's pretty good as well. So yeah, not a bad deal. Clearing out the Otterpus, getting the uh, getting the Piltover Peacemaker just a two-mana trade for about, you know, 
three and a half, if you will. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and jump up our mountain goat. I want to start getting those targets in for our Pantheon. I don't think it's... Uh, this is a game that's going to end too quickly. Uh, I typically think, you know, as you're up against Nora decks, they're going to have uh, the, the slower options in terms of uh, actually killing you. So I think that's okay. Now I'm going to just... I'll take the quick attack item here. It's just giving us a little bit more opportunity to hit with this high-powered mountain goat. Like, we can take three damage from the Justice Rider, don't care. But getting this attack in next turn uh, starts to be fairly scary for the opponent. And then we do have the Concerted Strike as well. Uh, just ready to uh, shoot down some of these big boys. Mm, that's close. <laughs> I, I was thinking when we did the Improvise, it wouldn't be that terrible to find a Pot of Pain. Uh, but... Wasn't wasn't necessary at the moment. Alright, well I assume this, this hit is just going to run into the otter post. That's okay. It will give us the gem. We can now gem onto the mountain goat. Just give the opponent a little bit of opportunity to uh, to, to play some cards before we try and uh, concerted strike. I don't really want to drop a concerted strike then have our goat get hit with a mystic shot. Should we just be dropping it at this point, though? It's, it's, I mean, it's fairly expensive at this point, but I, I ultimately worry what happens, like, next turn. Hmm. What if instead we just, say, play the single combat onto the, onto the Flashbang Peddler? Try and get this dum-dum off of the board, but we aren't getting as invested with our mana so it's not we're not like missing out on as much right we're not over banking like four for the turn but we still get to take down a, a reasonably high quality unit and then i'm going to heal it back up we've got a, a a decent number of these flashbangs in our deck we've got five in here hitting hitting one isn't unreasonable hitting two is something i don't think it's worth playing around Gotta kill that guy. Gotta kill that guy. I'm not entirely opposed to just trading away the mountain goat here. If we get into combat uh, and we get to trade the mountain goat away, pick up the Fixin' 5000 and then get to put the Fixin' 5000 onto Camp 4, that's not terrible. What if we just go ahead and load stone here anyways? Let's our let's our goat get a little bigger, uh, so it can maybe survive uh, the, these flash bombs, and then we now have the the quick attack for Camp Four. It does take away the the Harazi option. Right? We don't get the chance to uh, to play the big Darken, but I think it's okay. And I'm definitely going for Camp Four in place of Fiora. It's just a uh, the the Fiora OTK isn't very likely this game. We're never going to kill four units with her. Oh, could talk. Just a girl, her motorcycle, and justice. Nope, oh, wrong way. There we go. Now things are in order. And then if the goat trades again, it's going to uh, put the put the Harazi back in hand, and so... If the opponent wants to give up either of these reasonably high-valued units, I'm cool with it. Uh, since we get a good trade and then we get our big dark and for, for next turn of the turn after. We probably... Well, it's going to depend on what opponent plays, but we, we need to, to to start thinking about just hitting the lethal with this camp four. We, we have the golden Aegis to, to get the second attack in. All right, let's send it. We did pick up the, the Telstones, which is interesting. Say he wants to attack with Nora right now. We could hush Nora, get the block in, and then take the challenge 
uh, into one of these justice riders. Not necessary, though. Okay. This is pretty much out of cards at this point. It feels... Uh, I, I worried that... Like, we probably should have punched in just, like, a little bit more damage here, right? We could have gemmed up the camp four, played some of these cards to get some more overwhelmed damage in. But uh, now that he's played the clump of lumps, we're just going to... We're going to be fine. I was sitting here, like, eyeballing. It's like we can get three out of the Blessing of Targon, four out of the gem. We probably have the mana to get up to plus five with Pale Cascade. What is that? Eight, ten... Or four, eight, nine, ten? Yeah. Alright, flashbangs and stuff didn't matter. Come in and boom this clump of wumps. He needs like a burn spell and a wallop in hand or something. We should be pretty safe here. Click the collection, admit. It? I'm gonna go ahead and mark it. Mark it a W for bust. Alright, GG. Tearing right through the casual queue. This is <laughs> this is one of the things I I, I worried about. I, I I know that there's like different segments of people that play the game for different reasons, and so it's always interesting to see what turns up on Reddit. Uh, like the the thing I kind of took note of here recently was on the days of the Runeterra opens, uh, as the people in the competitive community are so hyped for the the Runeterra open being here. That's such a big part of the LOR Twitter and. Uh, uh, everyone involved in the competitive scene, but if you go and look at the uh, uh, the the LOR subreddit on the on the Runeterra open day, there's nothing about it. You know, there might be a a thread like 15 down talking about it and the streams and stuff, but in general, uh, there there's nothing going on <laughs> uh, on the on the subreddit in terms of the competitive scene, and that just kind of is what it is. It's not. Uh, it's not good. It's not bad, I guess. But it just kind of just kind of is what it is, if you will. Uh, but one of the threads I took note of was somebody that was like really hype uh, about all the things that were happening in Eternal and what you were going to be able to do uh, in Eternal with all the new cards and everything. And they're like spitballing on these ridiculous combos and stuff. And I was just like, oh. Oh fam, you're gonna you're gonna be in such a bad time once that ranked queue hits because that's just where people get to start seeing what's at the top of the meta and just net decking everything. And I was just like, you are not going to enjoy uh, what what the the future days have in store for you. The, the, I think the the time is here. You know, <laughs> it's it's coming in and it's coming hard. All right, back into the battles here. I'm going to go ahead and attack with the uh, the dude. I'm going to load him up with the gem. Uh, if the opponent has a sharp sight or if they have a standard sharp sight, <laughs> whatever whatever that thing is called, the plus two, plus two, uh, I, I don't want our scholar dying in combat to Shivana. And so I'm going to go ahead and load it up to seven, even though it messes with our uh, our targets a little bit. Cut out of there safely. Opponents preemptively playing burst spells, and so I, I think we're well and good here. We might find ourselves uh, getting a very strong concerted strike, and this is such a nice spot to be in. As we uh, talked about this in the previous games, as to where if we imagine opponent hooked Shivana or hooked our uh, our, our scholar here with Shivana, um, we we would have. Uh, been able to pick back up like the the two gems and the concerted strike off of the scholar now it's still nice the scholar has concerted strike locked underneath it so if it uh, dies we're getting a lot of really high powered cards back out of it i dig it man that's such a such a strong unit all right envelous vox coming on board the big dragons coming through i think we're stuck just swinging with our friend here the mana's a bit unfortunate. I would have loved it if we could have played Fiora, uh, just not attacked with her, and then uh, been able to have, like, a repost. Uh, I would feel so much safer on this board with repost, but not quite able to get there. And they said the Whoa. Were gone. Rallying, huh? 
Well, we at least know that we're safe with the Scholar. Uh, if he does attack with Envilus Vox, we can just Pale Cascade, uh, get our block in, and then be in a, a really nice spot here. Opponent agrees. <laughs> that is a really nice spot for us. All right, GG. On to the next one. Game 7 coming at you. See what we can do. So yeah, the, the thing I'm going to be looking to do here on the channel as well is uh, the, the freeform gauntlet is here. That feels like the other mistake that Riot made with this and putting the freeform gauntlet on uh, the first week and the last week of the format. So the, the new cards all come out uh, and everybody's all hype about playing Eternal and trying out these new cards. And then that really sweet format of free freeform gauntlet is out there. And I'm kind of trying to envision this like 15 card Legion rearguard deck that we're going to, that we're going to take into that format. And, and I'm pretty hype about the, uh, the, the prospects of doing that. And so uh, you, you may get a double video here of, of the course of the next couple of days to where, uh, we we take to a freeform gauntlet and see if we can't uh, <laughs> see if we can't uh, take it down with the old uh, the old Legion rearguard deck. Are we gonna get to see a vile feast? Y'all remember vile feast? Ooh, those were the, those were the days, huh? So let's go ahead and gem up the mountain goat. It protects it from the vile feast. I assume opponent doesn't have it. If they have it, they would have just played it right there. But it gets us the target for the turn, and then we can move on to uh, getting targets with Wandering Shepherds and getting these other bigger units out here. Interesting. Just playing a Nivea. Okay. It's a, a, a very aggressive usage of the uh, of the Spiderlings. So let's stop here. I don't want to invest too much more into this Mountain Goat. Opponent's going to have a bunch of bullshit removal spells, right? They're, they're going to have a bunch of vengeances and stuff coming out of this deck, and so I, I don't want the, the Mountain Goat to, to be the sole target of all of our spells. So it's nice getting a little bit of spread uh, with the Scholar on board now, getting to use... Uh, sure. Uh, a bit of our width. The only thing I worry about in dropping the Lodestone is this is a place to where uh, having Harazi can be a, a very real deal, especially as we have these Wandering Shepherds, if we're able to put a um, like an Overwhelm equipment onto the Harazi, it gives you that just big burst of spell shielded damage. Uh, wouldn't be opposed to having that. All right, well, we got to blast as hard as we can here. So let's drop in the Wandering Shepherd. We can play the Cultist first. We're going to have to Wandering Shepherd the Mountain Goat. So let's see if he spends some mana in an inopportune way. We kind of, it's like I, I always see the Shepherd's Authority. You get in these spots to where you're just like, okay, I need to deal maximum damage. And you see the Shepherd's Authority. And you know it's a mistake, but you still want to do it. <laughs> so, but it's one more point of damage than we would get out of the Mountain Goat. All right, then we have to open here. You never know if this if this deck's gonna be playing stuff like um, uh, the Ruination, and then I'm gonna boost our Wandering Shepherd in case they're playing uh, Withering Whales. All right, there's the bird. It's official. Anivia's a bird these days. We can go after her if we wanted to. I, I don't think it's it's that safe at this point. We ha just like when you have the two single combats, you have the means to take her down. But if we kill a Nivea and then he plays the Rekindler next turn, we're not going to feel uh, very smart in terms of what we've been doing here. Julia is interesting. I'm, I'm not opposed to picking up a spell shield somewhere. Pantheon's ready to flip as well. see if we get him here if he's going to say have a uh, a flash freeze onto the sacrificial scholar and then we just pivot to a different unit well that was the idea at least we can 
kind of we're gonna be short. We can. I was gonna say we can look to uh, use the other scholar, but that's not gonna work. So now he's gonna get an Anivia attack that's gonna give him two AoEs at us. So I, I want to drop Pantheon this round, but I don't really want to drop him before combat. The question is like, do we want to say protect this wandering shepherd? I think that's okay. We'll just give it the chain vest, accept this eight damage as it comes in, and then we'll follow up with Pantheon and maybe follow up with Yulia. Probably just need to go ahead and drop him though. I, I ultimately worry, like this is just such a bad spot if opponent says LOL pass, <laughs> right? If they, uh, don't let us come into this next turn. But with him tapped out of mana at this point, um, I I'm not worried about whatever these Anivias are going to kill. Stand with me. So let's take the kill onto uh, Dum Dum here. Opponent's not going to have any units next turn. We can still fill in with Yulia. Hopefully that'll be enough to get the kill. All right, see what we can do. See if we can't take down the old birds here. I'm armed. Am I armed? All right, we'll see if that's enough. We still have the single combat in hand as well. If we want to uh, try and fury slash faded off of Pantheon. We can look to single combat down one of these Nivea tokens. Just a, a, another opportunity for a little bit more damage. It's especially important when opponent's at three. Oh, I forget that these dum-dums can block now. Oh, that shit's annoying. <laughs> I, I did not consider that when we started this, but I, I don't think it was going to change anything. All right, GG. Make our way into that final battle. Get up to game number eight. See if we can't get a nice 8-0 set on the day. It's been good. It's been fun. We've hit we've hit from pretty much every angle here. We've had the, the good scholars. I love how much we've really got to feature the scholars today. Pantheon's been good, of course. We had a couple games threatening heavily with Fiora. We've had a couple of rally-styled kills with Camphor. It's nice when this really comes together and you get to, get to hit all the angles. All right, our final battle up against Aatrox Kane. See what we can do. So we got a couple of twos. It's interesting with Fiora here. I think she's probably too expensive with the hand that we have, uh, but there are a lot of cheaper-ish style units coming out of Aatrox Kane, and so it's a, it's a tempting target, but we at least got this this big start again to where uh, get the, the two drop, two drop, and the darkened lodestone. Do we want to lead off with the Broadwing? I don't think so. Uh, we already have the Pantheon in hand, and I really want to start getting the targets before opponent's able to pop off here. So we can add the Cultist. We're going to kind of preemptively target it here. And then next turn, we can add the Broadwing. He stopped and thought about that. I wonder if he has the... The, the Cultist Strike isn't good enough at this point, right? It's, uh, or the cultist, uh, they, they just reworked the, the double spell again. It only costs one mana if you've played the Ionia card. It only costs one mana if you've equipped. But slightly awkward here. It, 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 we can play the Broadwing next turn, but we're not going to be able to uh, give it Challenger. So kind of is what it is. We still got all of our targets, and then the the cultist is still good. I do like the guiding touch. That's a lot of surprise protection for our cultist. Give me some of that surprise protection, please. How bad is this? Okay, it's not it's not bad enough. <laughs> we can we can kill the defector. I still worry about him having that combat trick. Like if he combat tricks the defector up to, to five health, that's a bit of a problem, but 
Interesting, he just accepts the trade onto the Broadwing. Hmm. Okay. Not what I expected. It's such a it's such a high value unit in the uh, in the defector. All right, let's just equip and pass. It's it's a, still a pretty decent one here if he wants to attack into our cultist and then we get to drop a, a blessing of Targon on it. That's a that's a pretty big deal for the round. And then uh, if he just passes and we three bank into next turn to where we have Pantheon on board, that feels like a a win in itself. It's tempting to just go ahead and give the cultist spell shield. We have to worry about this cane on board a little bit. All right. What else can I fight for but life? Yeah, all right. Ooh, when Camphor turns up, just so perfect in this spot. It, it just it, it does everything that we need to come in and take down Kane. I was I was primed and ready to just get the Pantheon going, but this is this is exceptionally good now. Even if he already has Aatrox in hand, we're looking pretty strong. Like we could even just pivot. Like if we think he has Aatrox, we can even just pivot into uh, trying to kill him. Don't think this is going to work how opponent wants. I'm going to go ahead and Pale Cascade. Uh, I want to be uh, getting these additional targets ready for our um, for our Pantheon. And then we still have the seven damage attack onto Kane because of the darkened lodestone. The tough wasn't quite good enough. All right, looking good. Another Cam Four turning up. See, I'm ready to do dragon stuff. <laughs> you can say, "Hey, do you like dragons?" And then you say, "What do you say? What do you say after you ask? Do you like dragons?" So you want to drag on these nuts? Everybody knows. Everybody knows, man. I stand this a man All right, let's get Pantheon in. I, I, I worry a little bit that opponents just not going to attack with Kane. They didn't attack last time. There's a, a real incentive for them to not attack this time. And his only good hook at this point is on Yulia. And so if he wants to make the hook onto Yulia and then just get blasted by our overwhelms next turn, I'm I'm reasonably okay with that. Pantheon's not super safe though. He didn't hit, uh, didn't hit Spell Shield. I think he'll be fine. We have the the Telstones in hand for next turn, but something to worry about. He's trying his hardest to to kill all of our friends here. <laughs> so this should be safe. Uh, the, the strike card costs four mana. Aatrox Kane shouldn't have any other ways to deal... Ooh, you can deal damage to Pantheon if he has the, uh, the... The burn spell. So let's not risk it. This four damage isn't that big of a deal. So we can just take it. And we are just... We're just super far ahead at this point, right? You're right. That's where you say bust. You're right. And there it is. GG. Nice 8-0 victory. Well done, us, GG. So we can pull this up, talk about it a little bit more. And so I was, uh, I was pretty happy with everything that was going on here. Uh, we we got lots of these great situations to where the the pantheons were good and the theoras were good and the the sacrificial scholar was good and the camphor was good. I was happy with all of that. There, it still feels like there's some kind of tweaking to the numbers that needs done here. And I did really like leaning on this idea of playing a two drop into a two drop into an equipment. This is something that we really looked at a lot uh, playing Samira Pantheon and in, in Constructed. We played our list a little bit differently to where we played uh, the, the two cost one for Stellicorn along with Samira and then the, uh, 
the Linari Cultist, with the idea being that you could play a two drop into a two drop into an equipment, and that gets you into this really nice early game state. And so we were playing the full three copies of Darkened Lodestone, full three copies of um, the the Darkened Halberd, whatever the Noxus equipment is. And that feels like a space I wouldn't really mind being in here. Uh, I'm curious if the way we shouldn't kind of approach this deck is to take the Mountain Goat out and then find some way to fit in uh, the Dark and Aegeus. It's like, I just love the Dark and Equipment so much. They're good early, they're good late. They give us the targets that we need. They convert into units in the later game. It's just they do uh, pretty much everything. And so I don't think this is the space to where we really want, uh, like, the full six equipment. But it's something to, to really kind of think about, especially as we have a lot of these turns to where we play the Sacrificial Scholar on turn two. We want to uh, get... A target on it, but we don't have any cards that could actually target it. We'd have to hit it with a chain vest because we don't have any uh, cheap enough cards to do that. Or I should guess we should say kind of like on turn three. If we don't have a, a gem in hand, we don't want to be sacrificing another card. And so uh, just something to, to, to get that target in a little bit earlier uh, would, would make me feel a little bit better. Even saying that and realizing we couldn't target it with the two cost thing, like uh, it makes me start to think towards like action pantheon and then being able to play uh, the Darkened Bloodletters, and then loading up the Sacrificial Scholar with the Bloodletters, because then you still have access to bad uh, removal spells like grappling hooks and stuff, but a lot of the same thing still applies to putting a, a removal spells onto Sacrificial Scholar. And so, interesting stuff, but nonetheless, very, very powerfully styled deck here. I was quite happy with the Targonian's Telstones across the board. It's very noticeable with that gift to Targon costing one less mana at this point. There were a lot of spaces we could have fit that in in these games to where you wouldn't be able to do that in times past. And so that was quite interesting, uh, and everything here uh, I thought worked out pretty well. And so, good stuff. I had fun with that. I hope you did too, because that is going to do it for us today. And so hope everyone enjoyed the video. Hope we maybe learned a thing or two along the way, and you had a good time watching. So this is Boston Lee. Thank you for being here.